Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the first event in this year's Humanities Lecture Series. I'm Victor Bailey, Director of the Hall Centre, which organises the lecture series. It's our great privilege this evening to bring you André Cadrescu, a transplanted Transylvanian, to use a phrase employed by one of his kind reviewers. He's a man of many parts, poet, novelist, screenwriter, not to mention public radio essayist. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Kansas Public Radio, to whom we're grateful for good publicity. And partial funding is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, a federal body that is actually competent. <clears throat> That seemed appropriate since he's talking about New Orleans this evening. <laughs> Professor Cadrescu will take questions after his talk. If you would make your way to one of the uh, two microphones. Uh, afterwards, he'll sign copies of his book in the lobby area where there'll also be a reception. Everyone is invited. A reminder, I know it's in your program, but a reminder that tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock until 11.30, in the Hall Center, Andre Cadrescu will hold a question and answer forum, which is open to anyone who wishes to be there. To introduce tonight's speaker, I've asked Brian Daldorf, Assistant Professor of English. Brian teaches creative writing, literature, and writing at KU. He's also taught in Japan, Senegal, and England. His two books of poems, the Holocaust and Hiroshima and Outcasts were both published by Mid-America Press. He also edits Coal City Review, a mix of poetry, prose, and reviews. Please welcome my fellow countryman, Professor Brian Daldorf. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, first, I'd like to thank Victor Bailey and the Hall Center and everybody else involved in bringing Andre Kudrescu to the University of Kansas. What a great way to start the academic year. It's also significant, I think, that it's exactly a year since Hurricane Katrina devastated Kudrescu's adopted home city of New Orleans. He will be talking about that this evening. Whenever I hear Andre Cadrescu's name, he's always referred to as poet Andre Cadrescu. But to think of him only as a poet would be an understatement. Poet, translator, editor, professor, essayist, filmmaker, raconteur, traveler, novelist, and many other things too, Andre Cadrescu is what Victor Bailey and I might call an all-rounder. Yet at the center of all his work is the poet's imagination and the poet's eye. The unusual perspective, the sudden insight, the striking image. This is often yoked with the storyteller's love of bizarre character and a good story. Take, for instance, the short essay called Stalin, in which Kudrescu recalls his experience as an eight-year-old boy living in Romania when Stalin died. Kudrescu writes of a Stalin you've probably never imagined. He says, For us, Stalin was that saintly, fatherly figure that smiled from above, surrounded by adoring children. On my little nightstand table, I had his portrait, and I slept securely under the shadows of his moustache. Kudrescu then describes arriving back home where his stepfather and another man are sitting at the kitchen table talking about comrade Stalin. I'm glad the son of a bitch is dead, the man said, and my stepfather concurred. This sudden change of perspective is typical of Kudrescu's storytelling. He constantly surprises and challenges us as we read or listen. 
But even though our guest tonight is so often referred to as poet Andre Kudrescu, it seems that he doesn't have the highest regard for his calling. In a recent poem called Poetry, the Ancient Said, Kudrescu wrote with characteristic irony, I believe, poets, a bunch of murderers, if you want my opinion. Being one of them doesn't make it any better. <laughs> Kudrescu was born in Romania in 1946, emigrated to the US in 1966, and teaches at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. His love of New Orleans has been evident in his writings over the years, collected in his latest book, New Orleans Mon Amour. Yet I turn back to Europe for words that will sum up, as far as that's possible, the extensive work of Kudrescu. In one of his NPR essays, Kudrescu advised us to take heart from the gypsies. What he says next about the gypsies might apply equally well to poets, especially to poet Andre Kudrescu. He says, they may be a little crooked, but they are still looking for something and they can make heartbreaking music. Poet Andre Kudrescu, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction to those terrific. If I'm going to survive my introductions, I am going to do okay for the next uh, year, which is the kind of the new time increment I think in a year, which is pretty great actually. I used to think in five minutes and decades, and now I just think in a year. It's been exactly a year since um, uh, the hurricane. Um, changed uh, everything in uh, New Orleans, and uh, it changed everything for me as well. Uh, one of those events, well, probably uh, as big an event as leaving Romania when I was 19 years old. A uh, very different one. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the city and the year that, uh, this kaleidoscopic year that passed. Uh, and uh, how the images of our city of, uh, of New Orleans broadcast through the national media contrast really with our view from the, from the ground. And I will just try to give you a feeling of our, what I call our heavily mediated and heavily medicated city. 80% um, of our psychiatrists left town. <laughs> and everybody's crazy. Everybody's having a, ment a breakdown right now, suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome, which shows up about eight months later, nine months later, a year later. So when we need them the most, they're not there. When uh, the storm came, uh, uh, the, the, the refugees, they don't like to be called refugees, I realize that, but to me the word has, uh, has uh, weight. I like it. Um, because I'm a permanent refugee. Me and Henry Kissinger, actually. But... <laughs> well, actually, professional exiles. Um, so in, in, uh, I, I, will, uh, I will start this talk in a completely arbitrary fashion with a quote from Salvador Dali, which I found delicious when I started to think about this. And it is, and if in our age of quasi-dwarfs, the colossal scandal of being a genius permits us not to be stoned like dogs or to starve to death. It will only be by the grace of God. <laughs> Salvador Dali said that early in the 20th century, uh, referring to himself, of course, uh, referring also to a number of conditions that we don't hear very, we don't allow very much in public conversation now, namely uh, God and genius. Um, uh, you know, New Orleans has a genius, and it has a genius of place. And I constantly am asked to sort of say what it is about New Orleans that makes it, a, what is the culture of New Orleans? Because in description, in most pedestrian description, it just sounds like a plain bad place. Um, so what that genius is, that genius of the locus, is a kind of genius that has actually intervened with God. 
or you know, God's intercessors, saints of various kinds, to protect the city numerous times in the past. And uh, this protection didn't always work. And so we experienced the calamities that are part of New Orleans history, hurricanes, uh, war, yellow fever, um, other kinds of epidemics. But the difference between those historical calamities and the recent storm is that the expectations of modernity of our mediated reality is that the United States of America should have an immediate global solution to catastrophe. And the problem with this, this view led to all kinds of mistakes, grave mistakes that were unknown to the calamitous historical past. And I'll just enumerate some of those in order of gravity and then, uh, and then sketch a chronology of my own thoughts about, uh, about what happened in New Orleans. And these are the, the terrible mistakes. One was evacuation of the people of the city. Two was a confusion of authorities, which still goes on. Three, the politicizing of every decision and the reinsertion of race politics, including all civil rights agendas into the process, or for short, the blame game. Four, the race for a global solution. Five, the revival of every failed civic plan ever conceived. And six, the invention of schemes for reinventing the city. So to begin with the first one, a completely evacuated city is, a, is an instant ruin. To bring it back is nearly impossible. You know, send in the archaeologists is the end of that. To the credit of some New Orleanians, they never left the city. Uh, quite a few uh, friends of mine stayed in the French Quarter, which didn't flood. Um, and the French Quarter in Uptown, actually, where, where many people stayed, uh, were re-inhabited and started functioning within days of the calamity. And there were a small percentage of the city that came to be known to us as uh, the sliver by the river, or the Isle of Denial. So. The sliver by the river was the original city of New Orleans that was built next to the natural levees that were formed by the Mississippi River. And, um, but the Isle of Denial is also this place, uh, the French Quarter in Uptown, where the inhabitants can spend the rest of their lives ignoring the vast ruin of the city around them. And the city is still 70% uh, destroyed. Now, prior to the storm, one of New Orleans' proudest claim claims to fame and in a crisis its greatest failure is, is its provincialism. And the same culture that, that guards its uh, accents very proudly and is, is very, uh, it involves itself intensely in the neighborhood rituals and mutual aid and carnival societies was also the impediment to what is variously called now restoring, rebuilding, or bringing back New Orleans. Those unsettled, uh, uh, rhetorical uh, verbs gave quick birth to a number of visions, the worst of which was this sort of new orb urbanist and faux nostalgist vision, which is actually taking a very, a very solid hold. So, but without half the people who once lived in New Orleans, there is no New Orleans to bring back. When the people left New Orleans, they took New Orleans with them. So the first uh, um, piece I wrote about, it was called After the Deluge, and uh, I, I wrote about our refugees, but I didn't think, or evacuees, but I didn't think that it would still be good a year later. But here it is. There will be a little bit of New Orleans everywhere when our refugees move into your communities. Here are some of the changes. Your food will get better. <laughs> In the past 10 years, thanks to Asian and Latin flavors brought in by the immigrants, American food improved. Now it will reach sublimity. Instead of canned music, you will have the real life thing. Clubs will mushroom and street performers will make your town a livelier place. Start working now to remove the tight ass rules that forbid street theater. I'm sure that's not so true about Lawrence, but you know. Um, it's true in, in many American cities. Get ready to hear strangers open, to, open up to you in public places and tell you stories. You will remember that once upon a time before television, people used to say hello to strangers and tell stories. Several times a year, there will be festivals and parades that will remind you ritually that it's okay to be alive and you don't have to work like a dog without any joy in this lifetime. <laughs> there will be new coffee houses, bars, and the community centers where you will hopefully forget to be a couch potato. Sure, you might become a butterfly instead, but I'll take a living human drunk over a phony electronic pixel vampire. 
Many people will shoot their televisions. That's inevitable. <laughs> Speaking of shooting, the gun business will boom as it is doing right now. There is a follow-up to this as well. Other businesses will boom as well as skilled manual laborers from New Orleans pour in. Just don't expect them to finish anything on time. <laughs> the real estate market is booming already. There are follow-ups to every one of these sentences, actually. The real estate market is booming already. Schools will be filled to capacity, and there will be a need for more teachers. For more teachers. There will also be more jobs for doctors, nurses, firemen, policemen, and criminals. You will experience an overnight growth in self-esteem as our refugee poets and writers will begin to use your city as a source of material. You will also experience an equal plunge into embarrassment when they reveal what they found out. <laughs> you will no longer experience any faith in your government, if you still have any. Our refugees will teach you how to be self-reliant, depend on your community, and live without any faith in the government. The bums who run the country now will be swept out of power. First Bush and his cronies, then all the spineless officials and bureaucrats wasting your money in Washington. You will be renewed. <laughs> I see. So I'm preaching to the choir here. <laughs> you will be renewed by the intelligence of a whole culture, just like you're renewed by the refugees of Europe after the Second World War. On the downside, you will start smoking again. Um, speaking of which, I actually realized today that the cell phones are the new cigarettes because uh, I was looking on the street from the, uh, the restaurant window and everybody was using their cell phones in this sort of odd way. I mean, they weren't quite talking to them. Some people were opening them and they realized, what is the old cigarette gesture? <laughs> uh, the follow-up to these, and you know, I'll be glad to follow it up, you know, in, question, in, in, in the question uh, 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 period as well, but uh, uh, the business about real estate, all of these things that I wrote at the beginning of, uh, of our tragedy uh, became amplified. Things like, what does the real estate market in New Orleans uh, mean now, and uh, who's rebuilding the city, and so on. So uh, I will try to, um, to, to come around to that. Um, the confusion of authorities in during and after the storm was extraordinary. Our mayor didn't, did not have the authority to reassure any of the homeowners that their ruins were even theirs. Uh, the governor couldn't. At the national level, FEMA failed miserably. That's a story that is, uh, you, you probably uh, heard and, uh, and uh, have, an, have a, a you know, more rounded picture of from, from the media. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, whose levies failed us, panicked. Uh, Homeland Security couldn't figure out what threat category we fit into. <laughs> In the beginning, the president promised money, uh, grandstanding under the, uh, in the French Quarter under generator lights shortly after the storm. Some of you may remember this memorable image. And then uh, f a little while later, put the whole matter behind him in the State of the Union address when he didn't even mention New Orleans. Since then, he's been to New Orleans about 14 times. He's going to be there tomorrow. And it's, um, uh, none of these visits have actually clarified uh, uh, anything to the city. Uh, the only solution that occurred to the feds, and this occurred to them immediately, was the, mili the military solution. And in, in a militarized country at war, everything becomes war, and there is nothing outside war. And here is another moment recorded very shortly uh, 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 after uh, uh, the levees broke. The Bush administration wrote off New Orleans because it's not part of America. It's merely part of the coming American empire. The president referred to us as that part of the world. This is quote. Not part of our country, but part of a world that, like Iraq, has to be secured by armies. After doing nothing in the critical days after Katrina, the government response was to send us troops. With the city empty of its inhabitants, the armies of the U.S. marched around, guns at the ready, waiting around shops for insurgents who might dare break in for baby food and toilet paper. <laughs> it's true, I saw an entire platoon of soldiers that, that was crouching around an already looted Walmart. Two days later, yeah. so you know, I mean, 
New Orleans really prides itself for its lack of corporate uniformity. That's one of the things. And, and the, the residents of that area fought long and hard to keep that Walmart out of New Orleans. So, you know, the defense of Walmart was rather odd. You know. <laughs> We're not, never very sanguine about uniforms there, but, uh, yeah. There are, more, there are more helicopters overhead. Now, this is in the present tense, because that's when I wrote it, that's what, that was the case. There are more helicopters overhead than people in the city now. Earlier this year, the Pentagon staged a military exercise using New Orleans as a model insurgent Iraqi city. This is true. Jets flew overhead, battleships came up the Mississippi, and helicopter gunships flew low over the French Quarter in the Ninth Ward with, with loudspeakers broadcasting the message, stay in your houses, we are friends of the Iraqi people. Today, the Ninth Ward is still underwater, and I'm not sure America is our friend. We have always jokingly referred to New Orleans as part of the third world, a foreign country in the U.S. We didn't know how right we were. America either loves us or hates us. Those who love us love our music and food, the music and food that came from the depths of poverty and sorrow. The slaves sang spirituals to lift themselves up from pain and to get God's ear. New Orleans jazz was born in whorehouses, another means of alleviating pain. This music told the stories of the poor who had no way out of New Orleans except for Jesus or gin. New Orleans had other arts brought here by Spanish and French colonists, by pirates and renegades, by writers from other geographies of pain, and by Caribbean pagans. Consequently, New Orleans has the most diverse spirituality in the whole of our quickly homogenizing states. Those who hate us hate us for the same reason. New Orleans is Catholic, pagan, poor, and bohemian. The music is devil's music, and we are a cesspool of sin. In white evangelical America, New Orleans is synonymous with Sodom and Gomorrah. The FEMA website is directing people to donate money to Pat Robertson's Operation Blessing. It, it is the third recommended charity on the FEMA list. The first is the Red Cross, another story, amazing story, actually. Only a few days ago, the good reverend, this is when it was written, only a few days ago, the good reverend was calling for the assassination of Venezuela's president, Hugo Chavez. The administration put as much distance between the man of God who delivered most of the Christian evangelical vote to George Bush as it could. And I conclude rather coyly at the time, as sure as hell where we live now, hope there is nothing political about this. <laughs> who was I fooling, you know, I mean, come on. In New Orleans' as calamitous past, many questions are never asked or answered because the people never left. And by never leaving, they exercised the authority of the locus and, and used the genius of the place to meet and mass and physically threaten uh, urban destruction by, by commercial interests. I mean, they could always gather and, and have a riot because proximity is a kind of authority and long distance authority is nothing which is why several armies of the United States wandered aimlessly around in an empty post-Katrina New Orleans looking for an enemy. And actually, they almost started shooting at each other. I think the New Mexico National Guard and the Louisiana National Guard were in a, a you know, close uh, shootout situation. Because there was an authority vacuum during immediately after, and now it turns out forever after the storm. And the answer to the questions raised by the confusion of authorities hasn't been clearly posed and, and never answered, and it was never clear enough to become intelligible to the citizens. And uh, to this day, of course, we've re-elected uh, Mayor Nagin because he's a colorful uh, local figure, but uh, the guy doesn't have a clue, really. Uh, uh, or if he does, he certainly is making an effort not to uh, ally himself with any plan for the reconstruction of the city. And that's a kind of activism, too. I mean, that's actually very active. Non-involvement is... So there is a you know, kind of patchwork, um, you know, heroism going on in the city from individuals. Um, another point that I made is that the reinsertion of race politics, including old civil rights agendas in the process of the blame game, was written successfully by Mayor Nagin to his re-election and uh, is now becoming amplified by the Spike Lee documentary. I, you know, I'm sure some of you have seen this uh, on television. 
Um, the city has a black majority that suffered from a variety of ills before the storm, and it is, of course, true that the storm hit the poor and the, uh, the black neighborhoods uh, very hard. But at the same time, the storm was an equal opportunity destroyer that hit the black and white and Asian poor and the, and the more affluent uh, communities like Lakeview. And this calamity, like many others, including our major wars in the last century, could have been an upper opportunity to shine light on a whole slew of economic and social problems of an American underclass that's now divided by race. Politicians of every stripe have always been using race to divide people with common interests, but they have been hugely successful for quite a while now, probably since the Ronald Reagan presidency. And this is a bigger, uh, one of my students called it a pothole of boiling snakes, which I really like, because New Orleans has tremendous potholes. Actually, they have names, you know, I mean, they, all, they always had names. <laughs> But it is every, everyone who reads the paper can see that there's a combination of personal frustrations on the part of politicians, many of whom lost their constituencies and are in fact nominated to the city council, some extraordinary moment there. And there are a, and there are a great many unexploded uh, remnants of unfulfilled uh, justice issues since the civil rights era. And all of this haunts the remaking and retaking of New Orleans. For the politicians, it's potent juju and a lot of snake oil. Um, the truth is that everybody uh, in the city is, uh, is suffering. And if it is a race issue, it is one that is his historically, yes, but uh, at the moment, um, it's not useful for, to anyone except dividers. Here are some more pictures from the moment. Each day has its own pictures. Bumper to bumper traffic, two states long. A frenzied mob in a domed prison. Rising water. The hungry pushing carts out of looted stores. Rooftops in a lake as vast as the eye can see. Dead city, silent city. The survivors, the tribes, stadiums filled with refugees. Helicopters over a dead, unlit city. A ragged parade of decadence spitting defiance. Now this goes with the story because I went back to the city uh, four days uh, uh, after the storm and uh, the, it was the weekend of the decadence parade, a very um, well-loved uh, city event. Uh, and uh, seven or eight people decided that they were going to hold the decadence parade and they were marching around. They hadn't taken a shower in a long time and they didn't have any throws, and, uh, but they, 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 they scared up some coconut skirts. And um, the, the, the organizer of the parade was quite distressed because it's mostly a gay parade and he had to, uh, to enlist straight people and he said, uh, <laughs> you know, he's straight and she's straight, what's the city coming to? And I got... Um, <laughs> Instead of beads, I got this terrific uh, can of tuna. It was, my, it was a throw. <clears throat> and there were as many television cameras as marchers, by the way. Cause, you know, uh, uh, Molly's bar on Decatur stayed open throughout the storm, so it became the uh, world media headquarters. Um, a can of tuna, television cameras as numerous as marchers, a can of tuna and a strand of beads. Take that, you former shithead king. Another explanation needed here. I was uh, king of the Cru de Vue parade three years ago. I mean, this is really, uh, won't impress people very much outside of New Orleans, but it's an incredibly hard job to be king of the Cru de Vue for a day because uh, the, the mobs um, demand your attention as you parade. Uh, I, I, I had a sort of an 18th century uh, um, uh, rave suit on and wig with lights and things. And it was very difficult to sit atop this carriage with a mule that was pulling it through the streets while my adoring crowd handed me things like bottles of whiskey. That, uh, you know, so it's, it's a hard job. <laughs> but fun, you know, this was in the... So. Dead pets rotting behind locked doors, the smell of putrefaction visible. This is another thing that anyone who went to the city in the days after the storm will never forget, it was the smell of dead bodies, both animals and human. Muck, darkness, heat, an eviscerated pigeon, two dogs shot by a hired executioner, 
a sea of horrible stories rising like swamp fever from the foul mouths of dear ones from exile. Now, the business about the dogs is true. There are an awful lot of rumors circulating around the city at the time, but this, uh, this is true that uh, uh, the mother of a friend of mine actually paid somebody to shoot her dogs because uh, people are being evacuated uh, without their pets. They wouldn't allow the pets to come. Some people stayed. They didn't want to go. But um, she actually wanted them dead rather than in there. Eleventh day of hell, we are all working in this pit of sorrow to unfreeze time. In stripping away these uh, low-laying areas of, of New Orleans, the storms and the flooding made it obvious that New Orleans is an island, the northernmost island of the Caribbean island chain that begins in Martinique and ends here, the historic route for slaves, rum, and sugar. Those three commodities that allowed for the development of New Orleans have been joined in modern times by oil. The low-laying part of the Isle of Denial was where the slaves and servants, now known as the poor, always lived. During the historical calamities, the poor were never counted, never considered, rarely mediated, and never evacuated. They were also never represented, and despite decades of progress, uh, you know, one can raise serious questions about the efficacy of the representation. The organic growth of New Orleans neighborhoods took place in a media vacuum until certain of its products, like jazz, got out and headed uptown and downtown and all around the globe. Um, in the civil rights age, New Orleans received its due for the cultural genius of its poor and became a symbolic place for black culture, but also a window into the complexity of race relations because the poor were not necessarily all black and the wealthy were not all white, and the races of New Orleans were mixed and the people of color had divided allegiances, now apparent once again in the city's power structure. It's a very complicated city. That's why the simplistic uh, you know, race politics that the politicians are using is just, just doesn't work there. Uh, another uh, uh, mistake or you know, moment of flaw born, born of this storm was, this, uh, was a, the global solution that many people presented for bringing back New Orleans, or so whatever the current usage is now, but the first phrase was bringing back New Orleans. And this, this idea was, uh, this was the solution, is to, to, to do the following marvelous things, to protect the city against the Category 5 storm surge, to restore the wetlands, and to bring back the culture of New Orleans. And uh, the only thing that it didn't do, this solution, and many like it, was to bring back immediately the poor people of New Orleans. Because this solution couldn't include uh, the, the people of New Orleans because many of them are just simply not welcome back. Um, they left. They obeyed the, their authorities and evacuated or were evacuated from the city. So everyone knows except the poor in the diaspora that the city through this plan called Bring Back New Orleans was preparing itself already to become smaller and surrender very profitably to utopian dreams of cultural perfection. And this culture will be recreated if this plans ever come to, to anything through various rebuilding ideas that will be the culture originally produced by the poor people of New Orleans through, through, through their suffering, a culture that's already undergone several waves of kitchification, actually, before um, the this, this storm. The, the new unique culture of New Orleans, this is quoting a tourist, tourist brochure language, will have the added advantage of being unable to harm the tourist in any way, like a defanged serpent or a carnival boa without any boa constructed around anywhere. And the faking of New Orleans culture began almost as soon as anyone figured out how to package it. But it always had a bite to it because the people who might authenticate it were never very far. The new unique culture of New Orleans won't have the problem. Less than a decade before Katrina came to the aid of real estate developers, New Orleans was already undergoing a tourism and real estate boom. The tourism agencies were, however, careful to warn tourists not to stroll the wrong way out of the French Quarter past Rampart or Canal Street. And Katrina and Rita and the breached levees dis dissolved all those borders, and which are really a very real impediment to the creation of this uh, utopian cultural New Orleans. So 
nobody in the right mind in the city of New Orleans wants, wants these tourist barriers back. But of course, what has happened is that uh, among the first people uh, to come back to New Orleans were gangs fighting for turf, and there are a lot of empty houses there. So now there is actually uh, a sort of a low-level armed insurgency going on in the city. Um, so, you know, people in New Orleans, there are a lot of people in New Orleans who are not in their right mind. I mean, that's a fact now, but I mean, I'm one of them, you know, so. Um, because, um, I mean, simply, uh, there are some economic opportunities now that are just not for the faint of heart. And certainly the criminals and the real estate, serious real estate adventurers are among the first to, to start profiting. Because I'm not in my right mind, I had my own global solution to the city, <clears throat> which um, um, I published a broadcast a little while ago, um, which I still think would work. One, bring back everyone who left New Orleans and buy each and every one of them a condo or a house in the French Quarter or uptown. The money that FEMA has already spent on unused trailers, hotel rents, cash cards, and who knows what else, amounting to hundreds of millions of dollars, is more than enough to make those purchases at current marketplaces prices. Well, this is not exactly true, actually. Maybe assessed prices would do it. Um, and there will be enough left over to buy every person a new car, but you won't because the new New Orleans will be an entirely pedestrian city. Two, return all low-laying areas of New Orleans to floodplain. If anyone wants to live there, give them pontoons. <laughs> Allow also water dwellings on Lake Pontchartrain and the Mississippi River. Three, eliminate all zoning regulations to allow any sort of business, but especially nightclubs in any house in the city. Le I'm not sure what number it is, five. Legalize drugs, prostitution, and whatever else. Raw herring and red onions, maybe, like they have in, the, in sister city Amsterdam. Six, encourage tourists to expect the unexpected. There'll be a sort of a special division of the New Orleans School for the Imagination. Declare New Orleans America's cultural treasure, maybe a UNESCO world city too, and subsidize nationally and internationally any artist willing to work here. Any artist working in New Orleans should be exempt from local and federal taxes. Seven, declared New Orleans a PAS, permanent autonomous zone and an international city administered lightly by every nation on earth in alphabetical order. Um, <laughs> or eight, recognize the diverse spiritualities of New Orleans and produce various works of gratitude to God for having protected us this long from the ever efficient country of the United States of America. <laughs> Needless to say, nobody took this seriously, but Many of these points are being implemented as we speak. <laughs> so it's now one year. It's the one year anniversary of Katrina, and this is, this is my first report. There are two. It is the one year anniversary of our local and national shame, which was the response to Katrina. Katrina was just a storm, but what followed was so hideous that one year later we can still only shake our heads and vomit. On July 9, 2006, well into the hurricane season, FEMA was advertising in the New Orleans newspaper for the following regional jobs. Chief of Staff, Finance Director, and Emergency Management Specialist. I have to say this again because I still can't believe it. It's July 9, 2006, FEMA, our National Disaster Relief Agency, was advertising, let me repeat this, for a Chief of Staff, Finance Director, and Emergency Management Specialist. At this point, actually, I think those jobs could be filled by any three people going by with go-cups. <laughs> it really wouldn't take but a few minutes to train every, anybody in New Orleans for those jobs. You know, the chief of staff parks on high ground and goes golfing. The finance director steals all the money and hands it to his friends. And the emergency management specialist tells everybody to scram. In the space of one year, our commander-in-chief has evolved from a flyover disaster observer to profligate dispenser of cash. The only thing wrong with the vast billions that are supposedly heading our way is that they may actually be handed out in the form of checks instead of being thrown down from helicopters so that the groveling masses can wrestle for them like a proper Mardi Gras crowd. <laughs> Hurling cash into the streets would, in fact, be a much more equitable way of dispensing the the treasure, then handing it over, you know, to some of our 
politicians like Congressman Jefferson, actually, who found $90,000 in the freezer of his refrigerator. <laughs> so cartoon, actually, that said it was a rebate on his refrigerator. <laughs> but <laughs> it's a... It's, it's an irony that actually goes uh, somewhere because uh, one of the most vivid images of post-storm New Orleans are the refrigerators that everybody took out of their houses and uh, dragged into the streets and taped shots with all the rotten meat inside. And uh, these refrigerators, which are just canvases waiting, were filled very quickly by graffiti artists who wrote on them things like... Uh, Dick Cheney, do not open Dick Cheney inside. And, um, <laughs> chemtrails are real, you know, it's wonderful art, you know. So refrigerators do have now a very solid place in our uh, history. Um, the inhabitants of New Orleans were foolish enough to come back to the city after being screwed in a myriad ways by their local, state, and federal government have now taken refuge in mental illness. I hear a lot of my people talking to themselves without cell phones these days. I hear them praying out loud for Huey Long, Roosevelt, or even Stalin, actually. <laughs> I, I really, I see people staring at their feet and saying, Marshall Plan. <laughs> or people sort of deeply into their third drink and second Xanax, uh, you know, so speaking in tongues, you know. In all fairness, New Orleans is making progress in one area, artistic material. Never have there been so many rich and rewarding metaphors taking place in order to provide artists with absurdities. FEMA, yes, the same people, <laughs> threatened to take away Voodoo 1 and Voodoo 2, the firefighting helicopters that the agency rented to the city. We are now in the middle of a drought, well, we were actually until last week, with arson fires raging, low water pressures due to busted mains. And the question is, were Voodoo 1 and Voodoo 2 these choppers birth names? I don't see them going over big in Richmond, Virginia, after being yanked out of New Orleans. So I have to rename them for sure. I mean, so. One fire that either Voodoo 1 or Voodoo 2 didn't, never got to, destroy the local motel. And the hostelry went up in a blaze because, according to the motel manager, a romantic rendezvous went awry. A woman prepared the love nest by lighting candles and draping a pretty covering over a lamp in expectation of her lover's release from jail. <laughs> Happily, all the residents were able to flee their rooms and escape unhar unharmed. But what a lovely metaphor for um, your poet social observer. You know, you could say the motel is the city of New Orleans, you wouldn't be wrong, and the lovers are FEMA in Louisiana. <laughs> and the motel manager was George W. Bush. And the people who escaped or, uh, were us, you know, whatever. You know, you can change the elements of the fable to, um, you know, change the elements to suit your own fable or build it. So, what has happened, what else has happened of great interest in the city of New Orleans in one year that would reflect on our, uh, you know, on, on general uh, and, uh, and, and national concerns? So one of those things was the, the media and, and New Orleans. And that's a big story because uh, in one year, uh, we've experienced a deluge of images. And uh, for the first half of the year, there were one kind of images. And now they are, they are m morphing into other kinds. So this was uh, a little meditation on how we see us one year after. About six months ago, I went to St. Bernard Parish with my cameraman, Jason, to get my own share of disaster photography for the documentary I'm making, which is different from the documentary everybody else made or is making. Every fifth person in New Orleans now is making a documentary. <laughs> We're like the Amazon tribe whose families are said to consist of uh, mother, father, children, and one anthropologist. So Jason and I chose for our first outing a beach shrimp boat in St. Bernard Parish that was carried several blocks inland by the storm surge before it slammed into a house and uh, rested there to provide the backdrop for the news. I'm sure that you've seen it. On the lawn of the house was a broken plastic Santa 
that was shadowed by the huge boats, and there were these soggy school books. And uh, I bent out to examine one, and it was the first grader's exercise book. And the page I was looking on it had written in a child's hand a poem, I love Santa. I kid you not. It got to me, you know, I read the poem, you know, out loud, and, you know, I even had this sort of unscheduled tear come. I hope Jason got a close-up. <laughs> so when I stood up, uh, two women wearing T-shirts that said, Make Love is Not War were coming toward me, and we struck up a conversation. <laughs> and they told me that they had houses on that street and that this was the first time that they'd come back from Dallas after the storm. I asked them how badly their houses fared, and they told me that they hadn't gone into their houses yet. They'd come to see the shrimp boat first because they'd seen it in the national news. One of them said she was afraid to see what remained of the house where she'd raised her kids, and her friend had tears in her eyes. And I was in the middle of asking another question when, when my interview said, Oh, now there is a real celebrity. And she tore off the lapel mic and headed for Anderson Cooper, who appeared suddenly <laughs> with his own cameraman right by the shrimp boat. <clears throat> Anderson thought he might use the shrimp boat to anchor the news next day from there. So I asked him while he was signing autographs how he kept from being part of the story, and you know, he just shrugged. Of course, we filmed the whole thing. Those were the last days of the photogenic disaster when no matter where you pointed your camera, you hit pay dirt. On August 18, this was just a few days ago, uh, just shy of, of this anniversary, somebody burned down the shrimp boat. Around the same time, actually one day apart, two bulldozers that belonged to a company that was building a monument to the victims of the Ninth Ward were stolen from the site. These two crimes are both against image and symbol making and they are psychically related. One year after Katrina, we are no longer photogenic. The camera is focused now on narrow slices of rebuilding, which is all that fits within the land. If you've been looking at the city for a year, things look better. Most of the flooded cars parked on the neutral grounds and on the freeway overpasses are gone. And there's no debris in places visible to motorists. There are trailers and gutted houses in every neighborhood. If you look only at the swarms of life in these isol isolated spots, you might feel optimism. But if you look at what's around these spots, you feel dread instead. Sure, there's a recovery going on, but there's also a pervasive depression. The media isn't equipped to deal with both hope and despair. It can only show and tell one story at a time. The gray zone where we live now in New Orleans is beyond its, its powers. In New Orleans, nothing is what it seems. People believe things they don't say and say things they don't believe. To the media, we are recovering. To ourselves, we are sinking. Our heavily mediated and heavily medicated city is generating paradoxes, not certainties. About the time the shrimp boat burned and the, mon and the monument building machines were ripped off, there was a picture in the newspaper of a young woman from Los Angeles playing songs on a guitar to St. Bernard residents waiting in line at the parish office. The singer looked super optimistic, <laughs> and the woman sort of looked amused and bemused and disbelieving, but they, were all, they beat the deadline for applying for rebuilding permits, which was August 29 which is August 29, tomorrow. Um, so they were happy. Um, one of the most uh, uh, you know, unexpected um, things I did during uh, the storm was to respond to an email by my friend Jonathan, who uh, is the uh, uh, leader of uh, the New Orleans All-Star Klezmer Band, uh, all of the members of the band are scattered all over uh, the United States. And Jonathan wrote and said, uh, we need a project. We need some, um, some songs, some lyrics to put together, give us something to come back to New Orleans for. So I ended up writing a few songs. So I'm going to finish uh, this with two or three of these. But I'm not going to sing them. I'm just going to read them. <laughs> these are ripped live, really, from, from uh, 
our world. <clears throat> tale of two cities. This is a uh, story about New Orleans and Baton Rouge. This is a tale of two cities that didn't speak each other's names before the deluge. One was empty, big, and pretty. The other poor, proud, loud, and artsy, but that was before the deluge when the waters joined them and made New Orleans in Baton Rouge. Not long before the waters rose, one man only ever made the trip from New Orleans to Baton Rouge. He was from the Confederacy of Dances. His name was Ignatius, and he said, don't go there, it's full of yokels. There is a phallus-shaped tower, and the hicks hate us, city slicks. They have all the power, high and low. Don't you ever go there. No, no, no. They have empty roads and big, huge houses in that Hicksville, Baton Rouge. We've got us characters and civilization. Our cat houses and bars are known in all the nation. But that was before the deluge, when we redefined civilization. They welcomed us in Baton Rouge. They didn't chase our orphans from their tower. Tower, they let us cram the roads with cars. They opened wide their big, huge houses. They filled our scripts for tranquilizers. They made us feel that we were one big confederacy of dances. They made New Orleans in Baton Rouge after the deluge. Now, Baton Rouge has grown to twice its size, so all these people are still there, actually. And those, those uh, tranquilizers, actually, many people just didn't have any prescriptions for them. They just lined up at the windows of Walgreens, and they were handing them out. <laughs> Again, the animal story was, you know, was quite um, poignant. And um, what to do with your goat in a drowning world? And this was uh, again a story uh, that came via a friend who took, uh, who finally got his pet goat out of New Orleans, and took his goat out of the city. Here, the helicopters come over the roof, waters up to my attic windows, and I'm stuck here with my goat. I can see my neighbor in the hole on his roof. He's got two daxies and a tomcat. Just across the rushing river is his sister. She's cradling her baby and the rooster, circling helicopters, circling helicopters who'll take me but not my goat, who'll lift me up from muck and flood, but they won't take my neighbor's dogs or cat or his sister's baby's rooster. Helicopters overhead, nation to the rescue. Take the people, damn their friends. I'm not going without my goat. He's not going without his pets. Baby won't leave without her rooster. Lord, oh Lord, why don't we have an ark? That's the helicopters leaving. That's the nation to the rescue leaving us here in the dark. And uh, this is also a tragic one, but it's much funnier. It's called the Breakups, Songs of Exile. Oh, the married man's girlfriends. Oh, the girlfriends of married men. She's in Houston, I'm in Philly. Oh, it kills me to be here with my wife's large family. <laughs> oh, it kills me to be here with my exes and their brood. Oh, it kills me that it's Monday and I'm watching bad TV. I could be in New Orleans listening to the rain, just you and me, just you and me. Oh, the rain was bad enough. Oh, the wind was horrific. I'm back in the straight world feeling silly. He's in Houston, I'm in Philly, back where we ran from the big family. Everything seems way back then. Oh, the married men's girlfriend. So the girlfriend's married men. I'm not with you, I am with them. The wind was bad enough, I have no home, and your cell phone doesn't work. Um, which was another amazing story is that nobody's cell phones work, nobody's... Um, uh, battery-operated telephones worked in New Orleans. The only things that worked were the plug-in phones. And so friends who were still in New Orleans while we were in Baton Rouge kept calling uh, on their uh, landlines to ask us what we were seeing on CNN about New Orleans. <laughs> and I'm going to, um, to end with... Um, uh, this, these poems actually still, this sort of whatever they are, these songs, is sort of still uh, move me. And uh, I don't want to break down my tough Transylvanian uh, surface for you. Uh, everybody came to the French Quarter from all the neighborhoods and from all the people left in the city because um, it was un unharmed and there was no water there. and. Uh, people are coming back and they're sort of feeling like people wounded, feeling their wounds. Mother Quarter. 
acquaintances greet each other, friends they haven't seen, friends that haven't seen each other in ages, strangers meet strangers, the bars are full, the parking scarce. How is your house, darling? How is your life and your mementos, your chachkas and your mother? It's gone, I'm gone, but he or she is fine. Mostly I seem to be alive. It's dark where I'm staying, so I came to the quarter. There is nothing where I used to live, so I'm crashing in the quarter now. I drove 400 miles to be here. It's the old hood, the old ship, by the quiet, thank God, Mississippi. I've pulled away from the USA and set my anchor in the quarter right here in La Rose en Vie Café. I feel the dead around me who in times past came right here and sat in the coffee house and tried to think of what came next. Something always did. Some conspired to make money. Others wrote, kvetched, or hid. Something always came next in 1812, in 1850, 1956, 1968. Main thing, we're still alive here in the old French Quarter. Can you believe it's 2005 in the old French mothership? Um, of course, um, some of these are hilarious, I swear. Mm -hmm. Some of them are just plain nasty. I don't know. Um, Okay, I think I'll end with this, actually, and then uh, we can talk. This is the mold song. Of course, the mold in New Orleans is the, a big deal, and uh, mold was just this creature that escaped of various kinds of molds that came from hell. And uh, it did various things. And this is one part of the city being uninhabited for as long as it was, because people couldn't come back. The mold just ate their stuff. The mold song. It was one of a kind. The earliest map of the United States. It was hanging right here on the wall. The mold ate it all. In one gulp, the mold ate it all. And these books, the only copies of Newton, Franklin, Galileo, and the Shakespeare folio, the mold ate them like they was candy. Look at the satisfied grinning mold, stretching from floor to floor like a 50s horror movie mold. Not to speak of that stack of cash I should have never kept around. <laughs> Not a zero left in the whole stack. Look at me, I'm growing old, I'm giving myself to the mold. It's some kind of lesson, it's some kind of horror story. Keep collecting paper things. I knew that one day I'd be sorry. I'm not wearing a mask, I'm not wearing any gloves. I feel stupid, I feel cold, I'm giving myself to the mold. Halloween and suicide rolled in one. I should have sold, I should have sold. Only in New Orleans, only in New Orleans. Halloween and suicide, all in one. A man of means. So it actually came from a real guy on television, so telling his story about how the mold ate his rare copy of the uh, rare map of the United States. Thank you. Well, we'll, yeah. <laughs> and if you'd like to ask a, a question, if you could. Oh, I thought she was about to ask a question. No. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I was just going to say, I, I had a rather poetic experience of New Orleans from a distance. I happened to be uh, at the Burning Man Festival in Nevada when the news broke and all of these middle-class white people drying in the desert were learning about all of the soggy, poor black people underwater in New Orleans. Um, but I have a question. I, I was in Baton Rouge in New Orleans just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I went to Baton Rouge for a funeral, and the family gathered at that quintessential location in, in the French Quarter. We went to the Café du Monde for coffee. And I walked back into the uh, restroom and scrawled in ballpoint pen on the white wall of the restroom uh, were the, was a swastika and the words, New White City. And I was wondering if you might comment on some of the racial dimensions of, of what's happening. I was wondering whether that had been scrawled by a tourist or whether that was scrawled by 
um, someone from New Orleans? Well, that's, I mean, that's sort of a, 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 a teen spurt. Um, I, I don't think that there is, you, you know, uh, you know, a very strong sentiment about that, although clearly, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion in the newspaper about New Orleans becoming a smaller city, with, still with a black majority, but a much larger uh, white um, population. So I don't think it has aroused any kind of real uh, racial passion, except that uh, as the rhetoric of the politicians becomes more inflammatory, it becomes a real uh, um, fact of public discourse, but I don't think the people have yet bought it. I mean, you don't hear it in, in, in conversation, and if people think one way or another that it's a good thing, that it's becoming a wider and smaller cities, they, they won't express it. They stop there, or at least they won't talk about that when I'm there. Uh, but I don't think it is, actually. I think people are just too concerned right now with, with where they are in this gray zone. You know, I mean, it's, you know, in, in New Orleans, if, you know, it, it is really uh, um, uh, a, a, a city of mixed races. And everyone there knows that, you know. So I don't think it has the same kind of, um, you know, race politics, except in, you know, political rhetoric. So. Well, and political rhetoric becomes important. Um, my taxi driver from the airport mentioned that there was some discussion about having a celebration in the city with fireworks. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's another brilliant idea from actually came from the mayor who thought we should celebrate our anniversary the way we celebrate everything. <laughs> so then cooler heads prevailed and there were so more sober um, um, uh, remembrances, or commemorations planned. Um, although we did have our Mardi Gras after the storm, and it, uh, there were enough people there and enough uh, paraders to fill at least uh, a few cameras worth of uh, images. Sir, I laughed once early. And then I realized from my uh, study that uh, we were engaged in gallows humor and I refused to participate any longer. I mourn for what's happened to New Orleans and to our country because of New Orleans. I wonder if you do or whether we just should tighten the noose around the neck of New Orleans and push it out to sea. Your speech has made me feel like I don't have anything I can do to help anymore. You put me in a state of inaction, which I think is totally irresponsible. Well, thank you. I mean, that's my, uh, you know, I mean, there is, uh, what there is is confusion. I'm a reporter. And uh, uh, when you live in the city of New Orleans, you really have no choice if you're living there but to try and, uh, and be an optimist and mouth the cliches of rebuilding and so on and bringing back the city because even if you don't believe them, you have to believe them. You have to say them out loud. Um, there are uh, people outside of New Orleans who don't understand the city who would do just what you said, push it into the sea, because they don't see why it concerns them and why billions of tax dollars are spent on the city. And uh, they are heartless. So I don't think, you know, my, I mean, I love the city, uh, which is why I think I can be somewhat intimate with it, and as it is with things you love, you can also uh, um, try to lighten uh, the horror by um, pointing out the paradoxes. And it is a paradoxical place. You know, I mean, I'm not uh, raising money. You know, I mean, uh, uh, there are organizations all over this country, including the Red Cross, who, uh, uh, which raised money for the quote-unquote the victims of Katrina. Everybody gave. You Probably many of you did. You know, it is very hard to know what happened to that money, where it went, what exactly uh, the benefits were. And so to, 
you know, to call those things straight and, and, uh, and note them is really not to denigrate the city. I just ask myself um, why you think Ray Nagin was uh, re-elected and whether the opponent on that occasion would have been a better um, election? Well, Ray Nagin was re-elected for two reasons. One is that New Orleans told the nation, we do things our way here. And that was an act of, of defiance. And the other was that he did play the race card you know, the whole business of Chocolate City and so on. And the other is, the, well, there are three things. One is that he really is truly charismatic, and he does speak his mind, and uh, people like him. Even the people who voted for his opponent like him. Nobody, you know, did, they liked his, his presence in, during the storm. They liked, he comforted people. But then it became evident afterwards that he just wasn't uh, a leader. Uh, I had a, um, a comment. Um, I first uh, started listening to you on National Public Radio with your, your pieces, and um, I've been listening for, for quite a long time, and one of the things I think you represented from that area and from the New Orleans area um, was a perspective that it was okay to, to express poetry or to express creativity. Um, I think that's part of the underlying message. Um, that it was okay to enjoy life. And I think that's something that we've forgotten here in America. Um, I don't think, I don't think it's, it's reporting from the area is, is any way denigrating the area or denigrating America itself. I think it's, it's a call to, to um, celebrate life, which is something I don't think we do very much of these days. Well, thank you. Well, it's true that, you know, it's true that uh, media, uh, for the most part, can tell only, you know, a kind of story. It's very difficult to tell a story that is complicated and has so many elements that are, on the face of it, you know, un-American. For instance, the fact that New Orleanians really do enjoy uh, uh, life and they have a different sense of time. That is not a value that is very uh, well regarded in this ever-efficient uh, uh, society we live in, uh, where time is divided in smaller and to smaller and smaller increments, and uh, and only is only valued if it uh, produces um, you know something, makes money. Um, you know, it's hard to know how to make that a value. And this is sort of the question of what is New Orleans culture always comes in. Like, what is it? Because the ways in which we describe it, things like leisure time and, uh, you know, uh, knowing how to, how to linger over a meal or knowing how to, uh, you know, make poetry and music out of misery, all of those things don't seem extremely valuable to, to, yeah, to us now in this sort of very rushed world we live in. So, um, yeah, I mean, the... New Orleans is a countercultural city if you consider American culture right now as being one of efficiency. It's not, there are many things in New Orleans that are not efficient. At the same time, this is what uh, is also the impediment to moving forward now. So you have a paradox. I was just, pardon me, I was curious if you caught the 60 Minutes piece last night and uh, where Mayor Nagin had. Uh, basically touted the Trump Tower coming in and applauded and patted himself on the back on that, and just infrastructure-wise, what you thought, and socioeconomically, how this would all play out. I, did, I didn't see the piece, but he was quoted quite a bit in the New Orleans paper and on television without comment about New York, and I thought it was just insensitive. Um, I mean, Ray Negan now says whatever comes to his mind, you know, never, never goes past any kind of filter at this point, you know. So. Um, I was wondering, you uh, touched on it earlier when you mentioned Pat Robertson. Um, exactly, if you can go any further, what is your opinion of when somebody with 
a slightly flawed sense of morality and self-glorified sense of righteousness is capable of getting down there. And though I personally dislike the man, their project has appeared to help a lot of people. How is it that that organization can be so much more effective than the United States government, which self-proclaims itself to be one of the greatest institutions in the history of the world? Well, that was a speech, but okay. I mean, yeah. I don't know if, you know, if, if Operation Blessing was more efficient than I mean, probably in some ways it was, but I, I, I'm not really familiar with it, how efficient it was. I know they were okay. When I wrote the piece, what really irked me was the fact that they were listed on the FEMA website as people to give money to right next to the Red Cross, which was, an, you know, so it seemed that um, um, the you know, our, our officials had already made up their minds about who, who were the, which were the important, the important charities. And it, it seemed political, that's all. And I mean, I'm glad they helped, and I, I hope, I hope uh, they did. Could I just ask if there's anything really very positive, nonetheless emerging in the sense of Oh, the Times Picayune becoming a paper of real substance in a way that I'm not sure it was quite the same substance before uh, the catastrophe, um, and thus might watch over the the very complex politics you're talking about and really make it a better city ultimately. Well, that's a very good point about the newspaper. I mean, the Times Picayune suddenly grew up. The, the reporters for the Picayune were uh, not pulling punches. The, there was no cute writing in the Picayune for quite some time because um, um, no, everybody stopped playing at journalism and, and started reporting. And it is, uh, I mean, it's a magnificent period in the life of the newspaper, that whole, uh, the reporting of the storm and, the, and still, it's, it's a very solid newspaper. So yes, I mean, in, in, it maybe takes, you know, it takes catastrophe to actually bring out the best in some, in some, in some areas and some people. And certainly made writers of quite a few of the, of the Picayune reporters. So, yeah, I think it's a good point as to whether it will make it a better city. Well, yes, because the newspaper of New Orleans is uh, taking things seriously and people are very serious. There is a gravity in the city now that never, uh, you know, never existed before. So for all that, you know, those, those qualities of, you know, laissez-faire and joie de vivre, there is, uh, but a lot of it is just pure depression. So I'm not sure where we, we're heading without a, a vision or a kind of plan for the city. Everybody's on their own, you know, to either talking to themselves or, or being grave. You mentioned that uh, Baton Rouge had doubled in size, and clearly that city has been impacted probably more than any other city in America other than New Orleans itself by this event. Uh, I lived in Baton Rouge for two years and found it to be the most depressing place I've ever lived in my life. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, the influx has had uh, a true impact on, on the culture of Baton Rouge. I think it has. I think it has. I think, well, the city is booming, for one thing. It's, uh, of course, it's another city that has no plan. It just keeps sprawling and spreading. Uh, there are these new, ho new houses. The traffic is absolutely horrible. Uh, we have thousands of more students at LSU. So it's changed the city in some, uh, you know, the infrastructure, in the real structural ways. The culture, uh, f yes, it has to, there, there are, um, uh, musician more there's more music in clubs there are new clubs um, downtown is finally fulfilling its uh, promises of some time ago of coming back you know in some fashion so yeah yes you mentioned a vision for New Orleans I'm uh, interested to know what your vision is for New Orleans and also what your expectations are for New Orleans. Well, you know, that sort of was a tongue-in-cheek, somewhat facetious plan, you know, that I, I read tonight. But, um, you know, I, w I wouldn't be hurt if it really became a kind of a free port a la Hong Kong. 
um, in the past, not now. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, somebody said at some point, I'm a pessimist. optimist, you know. I mean, on Monday, I just don't think I want to live there again. And it, I don't think the city that I knew is, uh, is finished and the kind of struggles that are, lie ahead are too, too, too painful and really they don't require my, my opinion. And then on some days I feel optimistic because I see volunteers coming from all over the place, the artists uh, forming uh, groups uh, with plants for neighborhoods in the city, all of which is great. Um, however, the reality is on the ground, things like uh, you know, the real estate prices and who owns what and who's really writing the future history of the city are you know, mostly uh, disheartening. Uh, I appreciate I appreciate your remarks very much. I've uh, recently uh, moved to Lawrence uh, from New Orleans in the aftermath of the hurricane and uh, appreciate your observations and have followed your comments and all things considered. Uh, I also want to express appreciation for many people in Lawrence who have uh, welcomed me here. Uh, I, you mentioned in passing uh, Spike Lee's uh, film uh, I wonder if you might comment on that uh, a bit further. Well, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a moving documentary, and uh, there is no, um, no question about the power, the, the emotional power of it. I, I just uh, wish that he had thought it a little deeper, that he had gone a little bit past the... Uh, you know, one truth of the city, which is that the poor black neighborhoods of New Orleans, many of them are devastated by the storm, but gone beyond it in the sense of exploring a little bit the complexity of the race relations in New Orleans and the fact that the storm really was an equal opportunity destroyer. Um, I don't know if that's, I think, you know, that Spy came to it, which there is still a, 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 a sort of a, an idea that was there before he made the documentary and it stayed throughout it, although he made a powerful film. So this was, this was my one uh, dis disappointment to the film. It, maybe it wasn't long enough, you know, maybe it should go on, have two more hours. Uh, <clears throat> what do you uh, make of Attorney, Attorney General Charles Foti uh, charging and doctor and two nurses at Memorial Hospital for murder. It doesn't seem like it serves a purpose. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, That's more political posturing. That's more, more uh, you know, faulty grabbing headlines. I think that uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a funny case. It's not going to stand either. There are some extreme situations there. The Times Picayune ran a very good series on, on, on that. And uh, their conclusions are far from indictment. Well, I think we're out of questions. Uh, please do join us for the uh, reception and book signing in the lobby. Uh, but for this moment, for helping us uh, think about the anniversary of Katrina, please join me in thanking Andre Kudrescu. Thank